as as we're able in the house tonight. Somebody say, I know who I am. Say it one more time. I know who I am. And I know whose I am. Amen. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Let's sing it. I know who I am. I know. Oh 
you glad to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. Oh, my God, I feel the power and the presence of God in this place already. Oh, I hope you'll reach out and touch God as he walks by. I got a scripture, Micah 4 verse 4 says, Everyone will sit under his own tree and no one, no one will make them afraid, says the Lord God Almighty. No one will make you afraid. If you're afraid, don't be. You might have circumstances, stuff going on. Don't be afraid. No one will make, it's the B-I-B-L-E, honey. No one will make you afraid, says the Lord God Almighty. No one. No, I don't care if they're in the White House or the church house. No one will make you afraid. No one, doctor, no one will make you afraid. Can I get an amen up in here? Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. You are already in this place, moving among us and in us and around us. I sense and feel your presence. I hear the angel wings flapping all over this place. God, have your way and begin to move in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. Touch lives. Let people be changed forever. Let us know that we have had a mighty, powerful encounter with you, and we will leave this place and we will tell everybody, I am yours. I know who I am. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Somebody say, give me faith, give me faith. To, see the incredible, to see the incredible, to live in the wonderful, live in the wonderful. not just dabble in the wonderful, but to live right in the yes. middle yes. of the wonderful <clears throat> and to wait on the miracle. Just love this song. The first time I heard it, it's one of those you talk in tongues to. I'm just saying. <laughs> through the fire and through the rain, through every trial, your love will never fade. Lord, you are true. Faithful still, oh, even when I'm feeling overwhelmed, cause there is hope beyond the things I see, even in the dirt, I know I must believe, give me faith to see. the flames and through the flood through everything I'm covered by your love Lord you are here and I'm amazed my hopes and fears are met by endless grace cause there is peace that only you can bring even in my mess you hold the victory give me faith to see the incredible to live in the wonderful to wait on the miracle come on y'all sing it give me Anybody need a little faith tonight? Woo. Now let's declare this together. We're gonna see. We're gonna see all the walls come down. We're gonna see the lost in us be found and believe with every prayer and sound. We're gonna see heaven here on earth. We're gonna see light rising from the dirt.
about you, but that gets me excited. God, we thank you for your presence that is in this house. We thank you for the healing, the healing virtue that flows from your people coming together and loving one another. We thank you, God, for the justice that is mirrored in this church. God, we are here. We are all miracles tonight, ready to receive what you have. We are all miracles here tonight, ready to worship as a response to your goodness. Thank you for that tonight. Freedom is here. That means there's freedom for you tonight. Freedom is here. Because I'm not free until my brother and sister are free. Freedom So together we claim that freedom over one another, over our lives. And I receive it. See, freedom is here. Freedom.
spoke to you, know that working on fear and getting healing, you are in the right place. You are in the right place. And we are actually learning about fear and learning about courage. And I'm going to plug our book study because for those of you who let fear keep you from healing, we're doing the Brene Brown Daring Greatly book study Tuesday nights in there, six o'clock Wednesday nights in there. And there's a young adult 120s, 30s ish she um, on Thursday nights. Ask us about it afterwards. But I say that because we're learning about courage in that class. Courage is just being able to share the story of your heart. That's what courage means. It's sharing the story of your authentic self freely in front of people without fear. And that is what this place is about, is giving you that freedom to do that healing work. Brene Brown tells us we are here for connection, and I believe we're here for connection with God, but also for connection with one another. And so I challenge you during this time, we are gonna do our two for two meeting two, at least two new people um, in this two minute section. But I would love it if you would take courage. Sh take courage to share your heart story with someone, to connect with someone during this time. Because worship is about being your authentic self before God and before our siblings in Christ. So right now we're gonna give you a chance to share your heart amongst one another and find connection here tonight. So we are gonna do our two for two. Have fun.
<laughs> As we gather back, let's give a hand praise for uh, uh, Voices of Hope and for Pulse. For those of you who are regular, uh, you will know that there's been a little bit of a shift around this evening. Um, when I was uh, we're beginning our worship, um, I kept looking over and thinking, well, where is Sean and the piano? And uh, then I shifted my eyes over, and there he was. And uh, uh, it just, they throw us through a loop sometimes, and we just don't know where things are. But uh, what a wonderful way to come into worship this evening. Uh, we're going to prepare for the Word uh, tonight, and I'm going to invite you to take your bulletin, if you would um, just take up tonight's Scripture reading. It's from the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, or the Christian Scriptures. It's from chapter 5 and verses 38 through 42, and I've taken uh, the a paraphrased version of this particular uh, gospel uh, from the message. And uh, he writes this, here's another old saying that deserves a second look, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for your shirt off your back, gift wrap the best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Whew, this is going to be some hard stuff for us to hear tonight. So let's prepare our hearts and minds as we ask God to bless this word this night. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for this place that we call Cathedral of Hope, this place that we call home, this place that nourishes us, feeds us, and inspires us to our better selves. Help us, God, as we come into this place this night, as we encounter your word to speak your truth to us in love. And in that place of love, help us to hear these words that challenge us, that help us to aspire to something better, to something new, to be followers of you and to become like you. So now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this night. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the Christ in whom we pray. Amen. So we're in the beginnings of a sermon series that we're going to be preaching for the next few weeks uh, called God in the Mirror. And last week, uh, Reverend Andre preached for us uh, an amazing, amazing sermon uh, that talked about how when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we see something fabulous or do we see something less than? And that for many of us in our culture, in our communities, we often see something less than. Uh, we don't often see what we believe God sees. Uh, we hear all those things. We've heard them perhaps in churches. We've heard them in the Scriptures. We've heard that God sees us as a unique human being uh, and that God desperately loves us, that God has fallen in love with us over and over again, that we hear this in theory, but it's hard for us sometimes to connect the head and the heart. It's hard for us to connect what we, we hear, what we believe, and then how we live. Because the truth of the matter is that for many of us, we don't live in the way that we believe God sees us. We believe that other people can live that way. We believe that there are other people who are you know, fabulous, who are great, who are just awesome human beings and that live from that place, but we don't often think about ourselves as fabulous. And yet we're reminded that when we look in the mirror, when we find our place in the mirror of life, if we look at ourselves the way that God sees us, God only sees the goodness that God created. In fact, right at the very beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures in the book of Genesis, the writer of the story, because we know that the creation story was not written down as it was happening. This wasn't an eyewitness event. Uh, this was an event that was written about many, many years after the event. But the writer took such care and such attention to wanting us to know just how fabulous that we are. That right in that, that first text, the, the, the Hebrew word tov is repeated twice. The, the Hebrew word tov, meaning very good, is recorded twice when God created humanity in God's very own image. Right at the very end of that sixth day when God created us in God's very own image, each and every one of us, right at the very beginning, the writer says that we were good, very good. 
Now, in the, in the rest of the story of creation, uh, the, the writer says that everything is good. God is pleased with it. But right at the very end of that scripture, God says, and the writer says that we were good, very good. You see, you see the writer wanted to remind us over and over again that there is something fabulous about us as human beings. And that in that fabulousness, which I know we're going to get to celebrate this weekend as we walk down Cedar Springs for pride, that, that in that good, in that very good experience of who we are as human beings, we should always aspire to, to live up to that mark of what God inspired in us right at the very beginning. So when we look in the mirror, when we, we see ourselves as a reflection of God's very own self, we should aspire to be that fabulous, to be that good, to be that very good that God created us to be. And that, that means that we don't judge ourselves against somebody else's standard. We don't judge ourselves by the world's standards. We don't judge ourselves by the way other people see us. We should always judge ourselves by the way that God sees us. And that's a hard, hard thing for us to learn. In fact, I believe that that could be a lifelong experience. That if we just focused on that one piece of who God sees in us, we would have a lifetime's work to do. And much of what we've been doing over these last years together is really affirming just that sense of who we are in the vision and ministry and life of reflection of God in the mirror. The God that we see, the God that we know, the God that we aspire to be, the God that we love, the God that Jesus says that we should become as Christ-like in all of our ways. That when we, when we aspire to be like Jesus, we should aspire to see ourselves as God in the mirror that reflection of God's self. And many of us could spend just our entire lifetime just on that one, one goal of our lives, of trying to become like Jesus. But, but, but there's much, much more to our spirituality, and there's much, much more to our spiritual lives, and there's much, much more to us as human beings that we're exploring together. In fact, our book study, which Reverend uh, uh, Aaron just talked about at the very beginning of this worship service, helps us to remind ourselves to, to grow into our adult selves. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes being an adult is not easy. You know, some of us like to live like petulant children, <laughs> So, ooh, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> you know, some, of, some of us want to, to live as if we are the, the, the children of the earth and that we want to live as if the world owes us a living or that we don't want to grow up into our adult selves. But in order to be a fully-fledged follower of Jesus, Jesus invites us into our full adult selves to be accountable for who we are and to take responsibility for where our lives are. And so often we, we live with the consequences of life because we, we haven't yet fully matured into our adult selves, those adult relationships. God in the mirror. Uh, tonight we, we move our attention to this God in the mirror and the God of justice. And in order for us to really grasp the, the God of justice, the God that we see in the mirror when it comes around justice, is we, we need to understand that there are two forms of justice that are reported of in our scripture, but unfortunately the same word is often used for both experiences in our faith. The first is that we need to understand the context of the Jewish nation and the context of the Jewish people when they talked about justice in the Hebrew scriptures. When the, when the Hebrews talked about justice, when they wrote about justice, we need to understand the, the social location of the Hebrew peoples. You see, the Hebrew peoples were an oppressed peoples. There were people that were often in captivity. In fact, much of the writing of the Hebrew Scripture is about the relationship that the Hebrew people have with God as the chosen nation, the chosen people, and how they were either in captivity or released from captivity, only to find themselves in captivity again. We need to understand that the, the writings of the Hebrew peoples is from a place of persecution and from a place of oppression. These were the underdogs, even though they were considered themselves to be the chosen people. These were the ones who had come to rely on God, sometimes to be angry with God, sometimes even to reject God. But their uniqueness of their relationship was this conversation between the Hebrew nation and God and how God had redeemed them, how God had set them free, how God would redeem them, how God would set them free, and that this nation would often see justice as one day, sometime in the future, 
God would set them free in such a way that justice would arrive. In fact, much of the prophets are about this sense of the future justice. Something would happen. And, and much of the prophecies in the, in the Hebrew Scripture refer to the one that we call Jesus, a Messiah, someone who would come and redeem them, rescue them, set them free so that ultimately justice would arrive. And so this, this, this context of understanding justice from a Jewish perspective, from a Hebrew nation con, uh, experience, is really important when we come then to, to reference Jesus and justice. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus was a Jew. He was a faithful Jew. You know, we've, we've, we've sometimes undued Jesus. You know, so often in our, our own understanding of Christianity, we've, 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 we've negated the fact that Jesus was a Jew. He was born a Jew, lived a Jew, and died a Jew. And, 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 and part of his experience of being a Jew was that he was also in, entrenched in the, the traditions of Judaism and the traditions of, of what it meant to be Jewish. Culturally and religiously, he was entrenched in that a whole experience of what it meant to be Jewish. He also grew up in a time when the, the Jews were in captivity. They were once again under Roman rule, a group of people who, who were surviving under this Roman experience. And the uniqueness of this time for Jesus was that the, the Jewish nation had come to some agreements with, uh, with Rome, come to some agreements about how they would live and how they would survive, and in some ways they had received some kind of autonomy, even though they were still controlled by Roman power. And they believed that one day this one would come along, we call Messiah, we call Jesus, this one would come along and who would basically come riding in on that, that donkey or riding on on that, that horse and who would ultimately destroy Rome and ultimately set the people free just as they'd been set free many, many times throughout history. And so Jesus grew up with this sense of what it meant to, to know justice, to, to hear the words of the prophet that says, let justice roll down like streams of living water. If you've ever heard those scriptures, that's the context in which Jesus knew justice. But, but Jesus also came to an understanding and to a, a fresh understanding of what justice meant, what liberation meant for humanity. For if, for if we believe in a Messiah, we also believe that this one we call Jesus was also one who came to set us free ultimately from our sins of our lives. This, this Jesus would ultimately die on a cross for us. And, and so in some ways, Jesus holds these two things in, in direct tension in his own life about this God in the mirror of a justice that was very, very Jewish, that was very entrenched in their own experience of being released from captivity, and this new sense of justice, this new sense of justice that wouldn't just be release of the captives for the Jews, but would be release of everyone from our ultimate selves and from our own sin. You see, you hold these two things in tension. And so we, we hit on this scripture this evening. We have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You hear now where the, the, the rulers of Judaism have, have come with this scripture, have come with this notion of understanding that, that somehow God would, would rescue the nation, would set them free, and everything that had been levied on the Jewish nation would ultimately be levied on everybody else as they came to power and came to rule. You've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but what do you say, Jesus? Now, remember, Jesus was often being challenged by the religious authorities of his own day about what we understood or, or what the, 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 the Jewish people understood to be good rule and good theology. And so Jesus has questioned an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus could just sort of easily have turned around and said, well, that is exactly what I mean by justice. That, that ultimately all of us will get our, our just desserts and all of us will get the just penalty for who we are and for what we've done in the world. That yeah, with, it should be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I think sometimes we live that way, right? If someone's done something wrong to us, we want to levy it back to them. But we don't just want to levy it back, uh, the, the portion that they gave to us, we want to levy it back 10 times as much. You know, we're, we're a people who live with that sense of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
And we sometimes forget to read the rest of what Jesus said. Jesus said it's not about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus says that ultimately justice comes when we, we don't levy, the, 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 the thwart one another with the same levy, uh, the same heaviness of what has been levied against us. But Jesus teaches us to live in a new way. He says that if someone smites you or hits you on one side of the cheek, turn and offer them the other. That, that if someone comes and, and wants to take the shirt off your back, gift wrap a coat, the best coat that you have. Gift wrap it and give it to them. You see, Jesus offers them and offers us a new understanding of what it means to bring about justice because this is not about a justice system that we've used in the courts this is a justice system in the way that we as individuals are called to live. That if Jesus has ultimately paid the price for us, that if Jesus has ultimately set us free, not from the, the captivity of Roman rule, but from the captivity of our own selves, I think that we do much, much worse to ourselves when we are captive in ourselves than any person who could hold us captive. We hold ourselves captive in so many different ways. We, we hold ourselves captive to the, to the, the norms of our society. You know, I, I read this reading specifically from, from Eugene Patterson's version called The Message. And as some of you know his story just recently. Just recently, Eugene Patterson said, and, and said quite unequivocally that the Bible says nothing about homosexuality and supports marriage equality. And then the very next day, he withdrew that statement because he was under the same oppression from other evangelical leaders across our nation because he was concerned that his book called The Message wouldn't sell anymore. We live like that sometimes ourselves. This isn't just about Eugene Patterson. This is about the way sometimes we hold ourselves in captivity. We hold ourselves in captivity to somebody else's standard of who we are. We, we hold ourselves in captivity to somebody else's judgment. We, we hold ourselves in captivity because it's so much easier to live by rules and regulations than it is to live into our full and authentic selves just as God has created us right at the very beginning when God said that we were good. No, we were very good. You, you see, sometimes we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, what are the things that are still captive about us? What, what are the things that we have not yet been set free from? What are the things that we are still holding on to? You know, I've said over and over again that the biggest punishment we give ourselves is to feel guilty about something we did or did not do. <laughs> I want to tell you, there are things in, in my experience of ministry that I still feel guilty about. Something I said, something I heard, something that somebody said I said, but I probably didn't say, but they said it, and so I believe it must be true. <laughs> Anybody else had that experience in their life? And, and you, I don't know about you, but I give myself a hard time about those things. I give myself a real hard time. You know, as some, someone who's called to be a professional Christian, uh, somebody who's called to be a, a minister of the gospel, you know, I don't like to hurt other people. It's not because, of, well, it is partly because I like to be liked. I think Reverend Andre, uh, Andre said last week. But sometimes I just give myself a hard time. And my experience is that when I go back way time later, you know, that, that, that sin of commission and you go back and you want to say sorry for it, and you go back and you, you, you've given yourself a hard time, you can't look at yourself in the mirror. You give yourself such a hard time about those things in our lives. And I've, I've been back a couple of times and, and wanted to ask forgiveness for those things. And I would tell you, the person that you ask forgiveness doesn't even remember you did them. Ever, anyone else? Do I get an amen this evening? They don't even remember, but I've held myself captive over those things. Over and over again, giving myself a hard time. And forgotten that what God requires of me is just to do justice, do justice to myself. And when I do justice to myself, there is some justice in the world. And not to hold myself captive over the things that, that either I have no control over or to hold myself captive that stop me from growing as an individual. That stop me living into my full and authentic self. The judgments of others 
the times when we are called to live in the authentic self. That's what God in the mirror is all about, is living into our fullness, living into our full and authentic self, living as honestly as we possibly can, and living into our fullness as adults in the way of Jesus. Taking responsibility, taking account of our lives, those are hard things. You know, we, this, is, this is not easy stuff. Christianity is not for, 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 for those who, who aren't ready for a, a, for a challenging life and for a challenging journey. You know, I think sometimes we've painted Christianity as this, woohoo, I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. I'm going to walk around with my big Bible underneath my arm, you know, quoting it at everybody telling everybody else how they should live without thinking about the way that we are called to live. But Christianity is a lifestyle choice. I said this in the pulpit often, Christianity is not a religion. It's a lifestyle choice. You and I get to wake up every single day, look at ourselves in the mirror and say, am I going to do my best today? Am I going to live into my full, authentic self today? Or am I going to look in the mirror and see somebody else's image of me that either isn't true or is not perfect? Jesus said to live with a life of compassion. Live with a life that you can, you can afford yourself, that, that whatever, whatever everybody else's mess is going on, that, that let them live in their mess and don't get involved in it that we live into our fullness of our authentic self because we have to give justice to ourselves, justice to the fullness of who we are. I, I don't know about you, but just before, uh, w- during worship, first part of this evening, I saw some authentic worship going on up here. I, I didn't see people staging it or, or been choreographed, choreo- whatever that word is. I, I didn't see people manipulating what it should be to manipulate the masses. I saw some authentic worship going on up here. It it may not be your cup of tea or cup of coffee, (laughs) but I saw them living into their authentic self as they worshiped for us tonight. That's living into who we are and not being afraid that someone on the back row might say, oh, we don't do that at Cathedral of Hope. (laughs) We certainly don't do that on a Sunday morning. Thank God for Wednesday nights. (laughs) But living into that authentic space so that justice, justice comes to our house this night. Justice comes to your house this night. Justice comes first to ourselves because justice that Jesus talks about is a justice that sets us free. It's not just about nations and peoples and churches and societies. It's a justice that sets us free individually from the oppression we've set ourselves under, from that toxic theology that says you can't be uh, uh, someone who is authentically um, a Christian, a toxic theology that says the only way you become a Christian is by living this way. You know, this this Sunday, we're going to get to walk down Cedar Springs as Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ, and there are going to be people who are watching us on those sidewalks, and they're going to be saying, is that really a Christian church? Is that really people who love Jesus? Is that really people who love themselves? And is this a people that I might just be able to move amongst that might just give God a second chance in my life? They're going to be watching us, and they're going to be asking themselves, are they true to them? Or is this just a sham? Is this just a show? Is this just something that I heard about and know about in other places? Justice. When we look in the mirror tomorrow morning, we have to ask ourselves, am I living into my full, authentic self? Has justice come to my house? Have I set myself free? Because when we are free, there is no fear. When we have set ourselves free, we are free to love. And then and then we're able to, if someone hits us on the on the on the on the cheek, we can turn and give the other. 
when we fully live into our authentic selves, then we're able to give someone our best coat and not regret it. See, that's what Jesus wanted of followers of Jesus. Not to be people who get walked over, not to see ourselves as a, a doormat that someone can abuse over and over again, but to live in the freedom of who that we are, that we might live into that authentic space so that when someone hits us, yeah, it hurts for a moment, but we return it with kindness and we return it with compassion because we don't need to have that kind of justice, the justice of the Hebrew peoples that have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or rather an eye for a head because so often we just want to give it back so much bigger and so much worse because we haven't learned to love ourselves. Justice. Justice for you. So that justice might then come to the world. Because when you are free in yourself, then we set other people free. <laughs> when we set ourselves free, then other people don't cause us the fear that we might be outed or that someone might see something in us that they don't like. When we set ourselves free, then we become like Jesus. We become those servant leaders that are authentic enough that we can live in the world out loud, bold and proud. This Sunday, we're gonna continue our worship series on sinning like a Christian. And we're going to be talking about what it means to have pride. And we're going to reflect on that scripture that said pride comes before a fall and ask ourselves where our pride is. So I invite you to set yourself free tonight. What's that one thing in your life this night that still oppresses you? That still shapes you in a bad way, not a good way? What's that one thing in your life that, that justice needs to come to your house this night so that ultimately we can all stand and look at ourselves in the mirror and reflect again back to what Reverend Andre said last, uh, said last week was that we were good, very good, and that God thinks you are fabulous. Or as we say here at Cathedral of Hope, fabulous. <laughs> Let justice roll down like streams of living water that will refresh your soul and will set you free tonight. God bless you. Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. Thank you, Reverend Neal. Our uh, worship service began with a quote from Micah, and I can't help but think of the quote the scripture from, verse from uh, uh, Micah 6, 8, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. As we come to this time in our worship service where we discuss the events of Cathedral of Hope, what's going on, what's happening, I'd invite you to take a moment to grab the red pads at the end of your pew and pass them down the line. Check in, let us know that you're here. Um, let us know of any prayer requests you may have so that we can attend to them um, as our act of justice for you. We really care about where you are on your journey. Um, as I was perusing through this brand new, fabulous looking bulletin, isn't it beautiful? Do you see the update? It looks great. One of the things that I was noticing is that all of the announcements that we have here are about justice, about going into the world to serve God in various ways ways by serving ourselves and growing in our faith and by giving back to the community around us. So please um, would pl take note that we're continuing to um, take collections for, uh, for hurricane relief. Um, I need a few volunteers this evening after the worship service to help me and Janet move some of the donations we've already collected into her car so she can distribute them. But if you have any additional donations that you would like to offer for uh, hurricane relief both for Harvey and for Irma, we would very much appreciate them, and you can bring them here to the church. Um, just a reminder that we are continuing our Daring Greatly book studies that have been mentioned this evening on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays.
Thursdays. We can't do justice until we can reflect back the God in ourselves. And so I'd invite you to take part in this book study so that, so that you might come to greater understanding about the ways in which God is working in your lives and the ways in which we build up barriers that maybe block out God's light. Uh, as Reverend Neil mentioned, we are walking in the Pride Parade this Sunday. It's gonna be fabulous. Yeah. I imagine we're gonna need some help rolling these giant pink balls down the parade route. So if you're working on your upper body strength, you might wanna talk to Scott Stout in the back about how you might be uh, able to push one of these balls. If you haven't signed up yet to walk with us, I think that, you, you know, it's pride, right? <laughs> Uh, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, talk to Scott in the back, see how you can participate. Um, while we are not offering any type of golf cart or anybody, if you have mobility issues, please come chat with me. Um, I can direct you to a place where you can celebrate Cathedral of Hope and guide you to some ways in which you can join in the Pride festivities with us. It's gonna be absolutely fabulous. Um, also, as a reminder, as you walk out this evening, please take a blessing bag. This is one very easy, tangible way for you to continue to help our community. Grab a blessing bag. It's got essentials for people who are experiencing houselessness and homelessness and food insecurity. So you can just hand that to someone that you meet on the side of the road. So as we come to this point in our worship service where we call for your offerings, I invite you to reflect on the ways in which you are reflecting justice back into the world through service, through your acts of kindness and also through your financial gifts that help us to continue to do some of the justice work that we need to do inside the walls of the church. Remember that your dollars this evening help us to feed hundreds of people on Fridays and Mondays. It helps us to answer the phones to those young people who have nowhere to go and have no resources at all and don't know how to love themselves. It helps us to do weddings and funerals for people who have nowhere else to turn. They are tangible outcomes of your gifts this evening. So I invite you, please consider how you might help. With that, I invite you uh, to join me in prayer. Uh, gracious God, you who are with us in the very beginning, we are so grateful for your presence. We're grateful for the ways in which you have gifted us with many things, with our lives, with our hearts full of love, with our opportunities for transformation. God, we offer our gifts back to you, knowing that as we do, we are reflecting the inward presence outward to those around us. God, multiply these gifts that they might serve beyond even our own vision and help us to carry out your will in the world. We come to you in the name of the one who called us to go boldly out as disciples, doing justice, loving one another, and serving you with all our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
This evening we sing not just with our vocals, we sing with our hearts. And the song that we carry in our hearts is one of liberation. The song is one of love and it's one of hope. It's the same song that Jesus spoke about and sang about 2,000 years ago. Our scriptures in Matthew, as Reverend Neil reminded us, talk about responding to violence with other violence. And at some point, Jesus says, you've got to stop the downward spiral of violence in our world. But I don't want to talk about physical violence. I also want to talk about spiritual violence. You see, many of us come from different backgrounds in churches where it wasn't necessarily a physical thing. It was a spiritual thing. And people of God, it is a terrible thing when people use your own God against you. A God who's supposed to love, it is unjust to turn that God around into this monster that is supposed to cast you out into the fires of hell. The just thing is to recognize, as Reverend Dr. Neil reminded us, that we are worthy of God's love. And so at this table, it's an open table. And what that means is whatever you believe and whatever you doubt, you are welcome to come forward and receive this evening. Many folks come from traditions where they literally believe it turns into the body and blood of Christ. Big fancy words like transubstantiation. And if you believe that in transubstantiation, you don't even know what it is, but if you believe that, you are welcome at this table this evening. Other folks believe that, no, it's still bread and wine, but somehow Jesus is still present, maybe the real body and blood. Maybe it's the real presence. Maybe it's consubstantiation. If you believe that in your tradition, you are welcome at this table. 
Other folks don't believe any of that and they just say this is a symbol of something that is happening on the inside of my life. And people of God, if that is your belief this evening, you are welcome at this table. And other folks, you don't believe in magic bread or magic wine. You don't believe in anything at all. And whatever you doubt, whatever you believe, you are welcome at this table. The unjust thing, the unjust thing is to say you can't come. But we're followers of Jesus here and we say you can come. My friends, we recognize that Jesus took bread from the table and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it. And then he broke that bread, symbolizing the brokenness that we sometimes feel in our lives. People of God, no matter what we feel or what we go through, we are welcome at this table. Jesus only says, remember me. At the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup from the table and he blessed it and he gave thanks. Something that gives life, he gave thanks. We give thanks for the life that you are and the life that you are living. As you come this evening, remember not only Jesus, remember Jesus and the life you are living. Holy One, we give thanks that there is room enough at this table for any and all of our beliefs. We give thanks, God, that we are made worthy to receive this sacrament, this sign of God's love in our life. God, help us to not respond to violence, whether physical or spiritual, with more violence, but to respond by remembering Christ and to respond with divine love. In Jesus' name, amen. So my friends, as the servers come forward now with our prayer partners, if you need an extra moment of prayer, there will be prayer partners on both sides of the aisles. As you come, just pour out your hands and we will stick the uh, wafer in your hand or we will stick it on the tip of your tongue. We will also give you a brief blessing with the communion wafer and with the wine. It's grape juice, by the way. Um, and as well, if you need a gluten-free option this evening, please let us know. The table is set. We are all welcome.
give life, you give love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only to go back out into the world that song is incredibly powerful it reminds us that we go not in our own strength but with the strength of God that lives within us 
In fact, if we would only but believe that the breath that we breathe is the breath that has been breathed in from generation to generation. It's recycled over and over again, complemented by the creation in which we live. The breath that we breathe is the same breath that Jesus breathed. It's His breath that lives within us, and it's His breath that we see as we look in the mirror tomorrow morning or later on this evening and offer ourselves that sense of justice and freedom from whatever it is that has oppressed us for far too long. Go into the world and breathe. Amen. Go in peace.